Welcome to Catholic Homeschool Radio, where we begin conversations to help parents enrich their lives and make practical decisions for the future. Welcome again to Catholic Homeschool Radio. Priscilla McCaffrey as your host, and today I'm continuing a conversation with Bill McCarthy, who explained to us in the previous session what happened at the great Pearson Institute at the University of Kansas in the late 60s and 70s that brought about an astonishing number of converts and reverts. Of course, it's it's good enough that John Sr. and his colleagues brought so many young people to know the faith and serve God as well as they could as Catholic men and women. Uh, but um, there's actually more that's happened. Um, the conversions, of course, are enough to justify their effort, but uh, there actually are buildings, brick and mortar buildings and great buildings, which are here probably because of John Sr. So, Bill, we're going to talk about the fruit of his labors, and um, I want to talk about those institutions that uh, somehow have had as their inspiration the great encouragement of John Sr. to go forth and bring your light into the world. Bill, thanks well, again for coming. Well, yeah, thanks, Priscilla. And as we were kind of discussing, you know, at the last session, um, you know, Senior had a major impact on so many lives uh, through not only his teaching but his his personal faith and integrity. the uh, The theme for the the Pearson Integrated Humanities Program was let them be born in wonder. And oh, that's, they, there that's was beautiful. A, and you, the the logo that was shown is it was kind of looking at the stars, looking up to the stars, Don, mm. Don Quixote, mm-hmm. you know, looking at who's the, the, the great idealist, you know, mm-hmm. the impractical idealist, but he, he's aspiring to something so much greater than, than yeah. himself. What, what is the uh, state logo of Kansas? It's, yeah, aspire to the stars. No, I, Astra, I, 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 yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Don't ask me to translate okay, the right. Latin. But to the stars. <laughs> and it's, so it, that was a natural development, you know, I mean, in, in a sense that, of course, um, we want uh, the, young, the young man, the young woman to look to the heavens and to, and to say and to find his place in the world and, and to have a sense of wonder. It is, and and it's once um, once you've kind of embraced uh, that particular mode of life, and you you've basically been been captured by it. It it grabs you, and you can never quite shake loose of it. Uh, it's a uh, it's like a, a you know a great novel. You you don't want it to end. You want to be caught up in the okay. story. You want to be caught up in the adventure. You want, you want to be- your and you want your story to be an adventure. Absolutely. And Even though uh, you're not so much uh, being uh, quixotic, you're just, you want your life to have purpose. I think that's finally I, what, what I, it comes down to. And as you a, get older, you realize uh, it, it can um, wear you down a little bit to have a lot of adventures. <laughs> uh, well, you know, yeah, as we, as we, you know, put on a few gray hairs, we, we realize we don't have the, the stamina that we once have. But hopefully you, we retain the spirit of youth mm-hmm. and and we never betray, the, you know, the uh, ideals and and the, the moral virtues and and the, the mode of thinking. That is, you know, the great conversation in, in, the, in the history of Western civilization. And certainly the church has been, you know, kind of the cornerstone for Western thought. I mean, uh, even going back, you know, predate, even predating Christianity, going back to, you know, the Romans where, you know, there, you know law was important, but it was, it was loosely based in the natural law. And that's, as we were discussing last time, that those are things that are really not even read, you know, and certainly not given proper time to, to reflect and, and, and discuss and, and, and taught in our universities. So, Bill, how did the sense of wonder bring kids from the Midwest to Faucombeau, to the altars, and then to the orders of a, a priest, especially I know so many of them went into the Benedictines. Can you can you tell me about your travels to uh, Fulcumbal? What it, tell our listeners what well, Fulcumbal uh, is? Uh, Notre Dame de Fulcumbal is uh, it's uh, a ninth, cent- ninth century monastery that was uh, along the 
uh, the river of, of, of the fountain of Gambo. And Gambo was uh, the, the first monk. He was the first hermit there in, oh. in the ninth century. And uh, the, oh, okay. along the river, you can actually go across the river. There was There's a hermitage in his original hermit cell on the it, other side. of. It, this is in southwest France? This is in southern France, about 40 miles south of Poitiers, France. Okay. Uh, so it's it's closer. It's about two thirds of the way down from from Paris to the, the Mediterranean, and um, during the, some of the travels of of some of the students from former former generation, uh, they, someone had just accidentally stumbled across Foncambeau, one of the humanities students, and you know he walked into the cathedral, and it, certainly this was not accept, accepted at the time. The uh, the abbatial church was filled with singing, monks singing, Gregorian chant, and a, and a ninth century Romanesque uh, structural church. It was just incredible. <laughs> what, as what Zippy. year was this? Do you think? Uh, um, for the, I think the, the I think the, the, stu- the student the student his name uh, was uh, Trip Anderson, and he was you know <laughs> a humanities student that was like, became a junior professor. But he um, he just I think it was more by accident and in the mid seventies. This was I probably yeah the, more of the early seventies, okay. and um, so he when he eventually caught up with with John Sr. He, he told him about his travels and and how this particular monastery they still made their own clothes and they and they you know there there the, some of the chefs the monk chefs were the some of the best Parisian chefs etc and they just the there was such a, a richness and a vitality and a, and a goodness of the monks and they were practicing the Benedictine rules as if it had been practiced through the many centuries and it had not been been modernized. If anything, it had, it had tended towards traditionalism and going back to the rule of Saint Benedict. Mm-hmm. So it was it was quite a treasure find uh, for the humanities program. And through associations and through his f- uh, friendship with you know some of the few of the monks there that that could interact with the outside world, a number of the humanities students started making uh, pilgrimages from. Places like Italy and and uh, Greece and Ireland, when we happened to be over there studying abroad, and uh, a few years later, it was decided uh, one of the young men was l- learning Latin and French, and decided to enter the religious order. And, uh, after graduation, or right then and there? I think there were at one time I, I heard there were twenty six uh, University of Kansas uh, students <laughs> or or former students at Foncambeau at either part of whatever level of formation, and some were students, some were ex students, some were graduates, and it was it was quite a but it became a, almost as as a, to to punch your punch your ticket that you really were not a humanities uh, student as a young man unless you had visited Foncambeau. Uh-huh. So it okay. was a part of the, it became a, a, a informal part of the curriculum. Uh-huh. To, to, well, could the, could the women uh, participate in the monastic life uh, the same way as the men? Um, uh, well, they, how, they certainly can. And, and there is a sister uh, women's monastery uh, 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 Within a hundred kilometers of Fonkambo, Zhuk, uh, um, which is uh, further down by um, by the Mediterranean Sea, by Monte Carlo, and so there were a few vocations from the humanities fo- uh, program to that particular uh, daughter house, That's women's women's daughter house. So it didn't have the the the, co- the collective impact that the men's monastery did, but it did have something of an impact. And of course, as a, um, a woman, you could certainly, you know, visit Foncambeau. It's obviously there's separate quarters and there's a, a separate entrance to the mm-hmm. abbatial church, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, even this is, is so different for a, a young man to encounter where there is this, uh, institution that is all male and women are very restricted and this has to strike them as at least very different and for the young people back in the 70s they at least would have thought yeah this looks like the real thing this looks like the real benedictine thing and so again there you have that authenticity and as you say the integrity and the goodness of their life that really a, a attracts uh, the young person. Well, so how um, how many students 
uh, ended up becoming monks there? Well, I, like I said, at one time there were probably around 25. Uh, and I think some of those were just basically glorified visitors. Okay, they some were of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> in between things. Yes. And, and, and all, there were a lot of, you know, the variances to you know, what they're. Writing novels. And, but, um, <laughs> To, to visit Phong Cambo, especially, you know, during that time, it was such a powerful experience. And I, I visited myself as, as a 19-year-old uh, that it, one should do it anyway, even if one doesn't you know, aspire or think that they have a vocation mm-hmm. to the monastic life. So when things tended to shake out, I think there were, there were 13 or 14 uh, Kansans that had, uh, had taken some level of vow uh-huh. at the Benedictine Monastery of Funkambo. And, and many of them uh, lived there uh, for, this is probably uh, 1975, so we're looking at, uh, you know, 40 years now. Okay. That, uh, and and uh, I think nine or 10 are still monks. Uh, some of them have gone on to other religious, uh, the diocesan religious. There was one that became a Carthusian mm-hmm. because they wanted a, a deeper, you know, form of meditation. <laughs> as is, as is if that's back, not in, enough. In, 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 up in England, or where did he? There, there is one in there. I think there's one of the monks uh, is out, is out in California. He was a oh, Car- okay. Carthusian. Okay. He was at he was at the at Chartreuse. Okay. Um, All right. So. Um, all right, so the, we talk about Folcombeau because so many of your young people went there, but then there's a legacy that, uh, what, and what is that now? So, um, Folcombeau was uh, a daughter house of the ancient monastery at Salem in France that was a part of the Gregorian chant revival of Père Garanger. That, uh, from, that from was the, in the early part of the uh, 20th century, well, or the, the latter, part, the latter of the part of the 19th okay. century. And um, the Gregorian chant, there was a new emphasis and beauty, and, and I think Pius X, or one of the, one of the great popes, was you know, very much encouraging this. And so at Fonkenbo, during, you know, before the council, there was kind of a split liturgically within the church, and not to get off on politics of the church or anything, but many of the monks from Salam went to Fonkenbo because that was considered to be the standard bearer of Gregorian chant. Oh, okay. And there was a kind of a, a partial fleeing to Fonkenbo. Okay. And Fonkenbo then became the standard bearer, the gold standard for the Gregorian chant. And I, I think it's it, it still is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know of a place in the world. Uh, now, since then, Salam has has kind of turned around itself yes. and now they're Isn't embracing embracing their daughter daughter abby yes which As so, it, that's how it should know, work yeah. Yeah. and uh, just to fast forward uh, uh, a few years so uh, the american monks from from kansas then were uh, so at Funkambo for many years until the late 1990s when someone thought it was a, a good idea probably the the abbot of Funkambo pere forjo that uh, the americans you really should have a Funkambo in the continental <laughs> United States. You know, there's no good reason not to have your own monastery and to go evangelize and yes. spread the order. Thank God he thought that. Yeah. I think that's magnificent. Yeah. So, of course, um, these monks end up in um, the Bible Belt of all places and hardly a place to grow a vineyard. Uh, so that almost doesn't seem uh, like uh, Benedictine territory, but then again... Well, uh, it's, they, it's, they seem to, it's they, a raw, it's a rough, rigorous land uh-huh. in Northeast Oklahoma. Uh-huh. And obviously it was a part of the Bible belt, as you say. And, uh, Pere Forgeau, uh, through mutual friends and associates within the United States and some of the American monks started, uh, a bit of a quest to find out the find the perfect place for the future American monastery, and and did extensive traveling. And we were the monks were invited by a new a number of bishops uh, to come into their diocese and trying to find them land. And and, and I th- over probably close to at least five years, Pere Forgeau did travel in the United States mm-hmm. looking for the place. Mm-hmm. And uh, for for whatever reason, he when he arrived in Northeast Oklahoma, he arrived on the <laughs> Clear Creek, you know, and it is a clear creek, you know, yes, it's a beautiful yes. little, you know, it's part of the, uh, loosely on the extent of the Ozarks, Lake of the Ozarks. And, 
um, said, this is, this is where God wants this abbey in Clear Creek. So you have Salem, and then you have Fonkembo, and, and now the, the, uh, the American monks and one Canadian monk journeyed with three of the, of the French, French monks from Fonkembo. They journeyed to northeast Oklahoma, uh, Our Lady of Clear Creek. And that was in 1999, and they, we were late 99, and they've, uh, they've been building and flourishing and taking vocations on uh, since that time for mm-hmm. 16 years. All right, so not even 20 years ago, it was just a wilderness of about a, a thousand acres. Mostly a wilderness. There was a lo- hunting lodge that they used for was, part-time. But uh, now what's there? So I, if you if you look online, I mean, it was very much worth it. If you look under Our Lady of Clear Creek, Our Lady of the Annunciation at Clear Creek, yeah. and there are extensive photographs. And, and I can't do it. We can't do it justice in you know, talking about it. But if you go in and look, if it very much looks... Uh, similar to the ninth century construction at Fontainebleau. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. a replication using modern building yes. materials and, and standards, so, et cetera. So it might not and, take a hundred years. Well, we, you know, we, we've had this conversation <laughs> because I've, I've worked with Father Abbott uh, for a number of years on the project and, and uh, we thought very realistically it would be at least 25 years. Okay. But, that sounds great. But, but, you know, you look at some of the, you know, the great medieval can, cathedrals like Chartres, I mean, they they were continuing to build Chartres yes. over over five hundred years. Yes, you know, and, once yeah. they thought it was complete, then someone decided to they you know add, add, add some wonderful to, and and yeah. with with truly exquisitely magnificent buildings of that nature, great great works of art. You they never quite are they're never quite finished. Right, and, it, and that's all right. Supposedly, a, a new generation might have something to offer. Um, all right. So, how many monks are there now? And the mon- the monastery was built first. That's pretty much done, isn't it? At no, Clear no, Creek, when, um, it's it's in process. Uh, let's see. There's the uh, the new re- residential hall with the. Uh, uh, the, the cloister behind and they call the carriage house, which is an extensive uh, uh, guest house as well as a gift shop. And then uh, the they've started the abbatial uh, church, which is by far the most right. grandiose building. Yeah. And they it built roughly 65 percent of that. They're putting the, the back end of the church, the chevet, which is behind the, the high altar and and the bell tower that it's in construction right now and i think if you if you look online you can see the, the you know the, the progress of the construction when we were last there we uh, went to mass in the crypt and do they have the mass are they having the mass in the upper uh, well, level now well, well because the the uh, uh the church is under construction and you have you know flying debris and bricks and that type of thing. The when I, I was I was there last week and, and we had mass in the crypt. Okay. You so know, pretty down, much down still below. There. But there have been times over the last couple of years where they depending on how cool or, or cold or warm uh-huh. it is, they have had their uh, their liturgies within the church right. proper. And so, and more and more but the the acoustics and this is one thing that would strike you you know at, at being at Fonkembo um, and, and, and more and more so like Clear Creek is that when you, when you're actually in the choir and you hear the monks, it, it's, it's like listening to the angels. I mean, oh. it's, I mean, it, you cannot help being moved. Mm-hmm. I mean, the most slovenly, uh, you know, uh, uneducated barbarian would be moved because yes. it's the music of the heart and the music of the soul. Mm-hmm. And, and that's. Just uh, uh, and as as the the numbers have grown at Funkambo, and you have more voices and more musical voices and more trained musical voices, uh, the, the Gregorian chant is just is a, a, absolutely a, a break, breathtaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just and and who can go and listen to this? Well, you, anyone can go. Um, Anyone can go pray, uh, you know, whether it be the 10 hours of the, of the Psalter, the traditional prayer of the Catholic Church, the Psalms. Uh, you can go for any and all of those every day, and you can go to each of the priest has a low mass first thing in the morning, and there are a number of side altars. You can participate in the in, mm-hmm. in the low mass of the side altars at 7 in the morning. Might be a little bit of variation, um, you know, on a feast day or uh, 
or on Sunday. And then, and then there's a high mass every single day, which would be particular to the feast day or to the, the saint of that day mm-hmm. at the high altar. Uh, and, and that was, that's presided over uh, by the abbot himself. So, um, of course, they were in a wilderness, but uh, people have moved there. And is there is there a kind of a township or a, um, it's yeah. not a political? It's Hulbert, Oklahoma, right? Yeah, That's it, the people it, are. It's kind of it's the sticks. I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to insult anybody here, but uh, it's a, it's it's not it's not your normal uh, either city or urban su- suburban America. No, it's very much uh, countrified and, and simple. It's up in the northeast corner, by around uh, somewhat close to Muskogee, Oklahoma. Right, right, right. But but the, but hour and the, a half from Joplin, the, Missouri. There are families uh, that have collected around uh, uh, Clear Creek because they it's it's a natural thing we want to gravitate to prayer and we want mm-hmm. to gravitate to order and beauty That's right. and so a number of the fa- of families uh, have have moved to be very close that are have bought up uh, plots that are right within a geographical uh, you know proximity to to the monastery itself and and so a lot of them, those families are are uh, you know they're, now they're having children and 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 some of the children have entered some right. so it's oh it, it's like it, it's in like an old medieval village uh-huh. uh, very loosely but, yeah. but but that model and there's a movement within the um, actually started by a Protestant I'm I'm not a, uh, an, an authority on this by any means but it, it's called the Benedict Option a proper grammar would be the Benedictine Option it's called the Benedict Option and this. Uh, uh, the, this within very difficult times of of disorder and uncertainty, people gravitate to order and prayer, and that's that's starting to happen. It happened at uh, oh, you mean this is an observation he's yeah, made? Yeah, and that yeah, he expounds on it and develops option. it and is written I extensively on yeah, it. Yeah, because people want um, they want something solid. They want an anchor. Um, exactly. When. Um, a few years ago, we had a you know that terrible, um, that terrible slaughter of the innocents, the the little kids who were killed um, by that deranged young man um, up, up at Sandy Hook. There was a, a young priest in the local parish, and after that calamity, he received seventeen thousand letters. Now he had, he was just a parish priest and tended the people in that area. And many of the families uh, who suffered with Sandy Hook were his parishioners. But the point is, people want a point man. They don't know what else to do. They're overwhelmed with something terrible. And they, they want a go between between them and God. So they, you know, they didn't know this young priest. Um, and he did begin to attempt to answer each one. And his mother said, no, <laughs> you can't do that. But, but that is what, um, that's what the priesthood is about. And the monks are about, they, we have the sense that they are always interceding for us. They're covering our backs. And it's, and we have the sense that if proximity is a good thing too, uh, because they are always there as a witness, no, it's uh, and just knowing the little that I do about about the monastic life, I, I know that the, the uh, as you as you mentioned this priest in that in that tragedy, there the monks themselves receive hundreds and hundreds of prayer requests mm-hmm. every day, and and from normal people with you know modest moderate normal problems to heads of state oh, and really? and uh, I'm glad pe- to hear that people in the middle you know not as many as there should be <laughs> but but people that are really you know at critical moments that where they they need serious prayer and they need efficacious prayer they contact the monks so mm-hmm. the monks have you know told me you know independently that please do you know please do make the request for prayer because we need to have that association with the outside world. Yes. We we're okay. kind of the, or the, the monks are the kind of the heart of the church. Mm-hmm. They're the beating heart of prayer in the church because they're constantly at the altar of God. Mm-hmm. They're the ones I send my mass requests to. Well, that's great. You know, and being there, I, I, I remember a few years ago, uh, 
and I I don't tend to be in any way contemplative at all. But <laughs> but I was there for on a on something a retreat during Lent, and uh, I was just was amazed that you know I was I tend to be up early and I went into the middle of the night where the the, the guest the guest house has a passageway secret back passageway to get into into the into the church, and there were there were monks up. In the middle of the night. I love that. Keeping vigil, you know, and just like statues, you know, in front of yes, the Holy of the Holies. Sentinels in the night. Yeah, just and just in front of the Holy of Holies. And and it's it just that goes on and ever and it intensifies. And there are times of years that, you know, it it, it 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 the ebb the ebb and flow, but obviously during the penitential time of Lent. And so the next morning I just remember being uh, you know, sitting in the in the refectory for breakfast, and it was a modest breakfast that that they were serving the guest. But then I was, well, when did the monks eat? I was wondering when the monks eat. And then I Their saw crust of bread. They, they 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 came in for two minutes. They stood and basically they they basically woofed down a little bit of the the goulash mishmash of the leftovers oh, from no. the day before it oh. was day before and they were there for just 90 oh. 90 seconds on their feet and then they were off well that and but that was the, the penitential it was a penitential practice yes. that, that, that they're, they're very serious about the salvation of souls they're very serious about glorification of god mm-hmm. and the and the beauty uh, the proper beauty of the liturgy which people can sing and yeah. um, all right, I would love to talk more about Clear Creek, but uh, I want to just uh, t- touch on Wyoming Catholic College because uh, that also has was inspired by some of the students and maybe one of the professors. Well, at, uh, so the, the, a junior prof- junior professor from. Uh, for, who was a student of John Seniors at the University of Wyoming? So he went. He oh, went way oh, back. Oh, okay. A friend of ours, uh, uh, Bob Carlson, Dr. Robert Carlson, and eventually he followed John Senior to the uh, University of Kansas, where he um, he received a Ph.D. in classics as well, and was probably you know one of Senior's prize students, and and then eventually uh, received a teaching position in philosophy and classics at the University of Wyoming. So uh, things went full circle, you okay. know, senior in Kansas and Wyoming, and, and uh, Bob taught for the University of Wyoming for a number of years, and then and then was eligible for retirement, retired, but he had had this burning desire to found a Catholic college, basically modeled after the the vision of education of, of John Senior, and so he he basically long long story short, you know, there were there were numerous years of of uh, of planning and plotting and and the practical issues of where is the college or we're gonna we have the resources for the college and and this went on and on and and uh, through through various you know providential things this the school was was eventually founded um, in Lander Wyoming which is very close to the Wind River uh, reservation, uh, ra- the Shoshone Reservation mm-hmm. Range, and just uh, the Continental Divide and the rock, the kind of the s- spear of the crowning jewel of the Rocky Mountains is breathtaking and beautiful. And part and of the part of the curriculum is to well, your, da- your daughter, your daughter was just like there. <laughs> uh, I was all for this. It, it is an incredible adventure. <laughs> Uh, 21 days, no washing of the hair, no blow dryers. <laughs> um, <laughs> you either bury it or carry it. It's um, it's really rigorous. Um, they did have a, a, a grizzly bear in their camp. And uh, this, you know, I knew that was a possibility, but I wasn't going to worry about it. Um, it turns out that there was a, a fine Jesuit in their little group. Um, you, they divide the kids up into groups of about nine. Then they have three counselors of the same sex. And then there's a priest with each group. Um, this priest was a, an athletic man. Um, he said, yes, I'm a Jesuit. And uh, yes, there are bad Jesuits, but um, not only. <laughs> and uh, I assume he says the same thing about grizzlies. Um, there are bad grizzlies. But the grizzly that came into his tent took... Uh, half of the unconsecrated hosts. Oh, my uh, goodness. Uh, that's a little too close. Um, I understand they have bear spray, but to use that, I think you're too close to a bear. And I'm still hoping that these girls are packing, somebody's packing, because um, 
that I, it doesn't well, <laughs> I don't know that I have a little bit of know, a problem with that uh, the know. girls had a fantastic time they came home to talk about it but they, I don't want a memorial set up in the Wind River Range they learned know. great survival skills they did and they and they, indeed they did and, and it's uh I, uh, my niece is also in that pro- oh, program and is yeah, also she's room, her roommate. She's right. rooms with your daughter, Monica, my, my daughter, my niece, Evelyn. And I know that there's always going to be that possibility because there is the adventure and the somewhat of the trepidation of the being in the dangerous mountains and things can go wrong, etc. Normally speaking, they don't have grizzly bears. Grizzlies are pretty much up in Alaska now. There might be, but it's... That's a, what the, the okay, girls were told. No there might have been a brown bear and not a grizzly bear and they're and they're like you know big dogs where they'll come they will come in if there's okay. food in the camp yeah. there's food in the camp they will come in and they will find yeah. the food well uh, the, uh, this priest had uh, his f- book fellowship of the ring slashed with uh, the claw marks so uh, right. Maybe we can determine if it's just well, just, it, it just a brown yeah, bear. Just I mean, a, for heaven's yeah, sake. I uh, I had a similar experience where we were up in the winds, and a and a bear came into my camp and and ripped my pack and and ran ran off with my pack that had my wallet and my buddy's keys in it. And That's a uh, I had a copy of the agony and the ecstasy it was a, a, like a five hundred plus page. Uh, uh, paperback and he, the, tore the, he, he tried to eat it <laughs> oh, and, and I still have it at home and the bear bit entirely through the length of the book oh, 500 pages so they'll, they'll they'll try to eat anything yeah. um uh, I've I've seen you know dogs up there. If you're really kind of if you're uh, willing to dogs? take a, take a take a dog, you know that's not afraid oh, of the bring bear. Oh, bring dogs up. And they'll, ah. and, they'll, and they'll and they'll you know they'll run them off, and they're, okay. they're, they'll you know they might die uh, doing okay. so. But I'm going to suggest that that'll be my. <laughs> can you just take a dog, please? Okay, so that that is one of the exciting adventures we want our kids to have that John Senior always promoted. Uh, I'm glad it's over. Uh, the but, and she's going to have um, another trip into the into the ice into the uh, into the winter trip the winter wilderness <laughs> uh, okay but um, and then you I only was... have to worry about frostbite all the bears all the bears are still out they're more active in the winter months they are yes no 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 they go into hibernation uh, what's a... really no, that's something... crazy okay so I'll feel better about that they're they're all hibernating but um, again she's you know that's one thing that's fantastic but the program is excellent too it's fine and it has. I really like the professors that I saw. Um, God bless uh, Robert Carlson. Is he retired now? He is. He's um, he's uh, he's retired, and uh, so he's still, ca- his vision helped to I, I bring this so. institution the, 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 along. The curriculum, cur- you know, the curriculum, it's taken a while to to, uh, to settle in. Yeah. And I know they have an equestrian program yeah. where they're riding horses, and that's a it's a key kind of a. Sl- all a part of the idea of actually knowing, but also doing, and yeah. you know, not just having theoretical knowledge, but also active right. knowledge that you put into practice. And I think that's one of the key components of doing the uh, outward bound, uh, where you go yeah. out yeah, and and, and yeah. learn how to survive on your own in the mountains. But the beautiful thing is, and they do say it's like an outward bound program. However, it's um, it's to encounter. God's beauty, absolutely, and, and therefore A- absolutely. God. So, it's, so th- then it's so meaningful, so purposeful, and it gives them a, a something to take into the rest of their lives. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, you know looking to the stars and looking to the heavens. Ad Astra, and, Aspera, it, is that Aspera Ad Astra? You, okay. Yes, it's odd. <laughs> We're not Aspera, classics majors. Aspera, I, odd, Aspera. Yeah, no, you. I, okay, you had it right. Um, but if you, you know, if you look, if you look to the stars in the Wind River Range, there is no artificial light whatsoever. Mm-hmm. You know, you might have a little camp lantern or something, but if you get out on a clear night. You can't. It's not just the Milky Way that you see. You see literally hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Really? The, the, oh yeah. The the, the stars the are too. Oh my gosh. You could. They're too numerous to even count. I mm-hmm. mean, it's an unbelievable uh, experience. You see shooting stars, and well, well, unfortunately, I guess I'll have to risk it sometime. Un- unfortunately, you see satellites and that type of thing. But <laughs> you'll have to ask Monica about that question. Yeah, I will. <laughs> okay, and then we're gonna. So that's. Um, so we've got. Uh, Clear Creek in Oklahoma, uh, Wyoming Catholic College 
in Wy- Lander, Wyoming, and then let's sweep back down to the Southwest where you come from. How was it? How did you do this, Bill? Uh, do, you have your own private exactly, little monastery going up there no, on, no, on uh, no, uh, 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 next to your property? What, uh, what's uh, happened here? So um, <laughs> actually, and, and this is not an infomercial by any means, but uh, we were talking about the Benedictine option uh, earlier. Uh, through some some younger families uh, with small children, as a matter of fact, they all kind of con- got together and said, Would, "Wouldn't it be great if we could entice the monks?" Because at a certain point, uh, I'm referring to Clear Creek. At a certain point, they reach a certain number that they must have an outreach. They much must branch out, and so the monks will be looking for a second uh, a second abbey, and they've been growing and flourishing and building, and now so. Um, at, at first, uh, so a few of the monks would be sent out by Father Abbot Anderson uh, because it was so hot in northeast Oklahoma and humid that some of the a few of the, the monks would get heat exhaustion. They, they just couldn't. Oh, really? They couldn't handle the, they, the heat. Those are the, those are the ones from Celtic. Yeah. Descent. I mean, I, I understand that <laughs> totally. I could not have saved my soul in the Congo. And and they so they, they would come out for just a, a visit for a couple of weeks when it was super hot in Oklahoma and it's dry and cooler up in the in the pine trees mm-hmm. at seventy five hundred feet above sea level in the Zuni Mountains in uh, in outside of Gallup, New Mexico, where I live. Well, these particular uh, mountains, we we uh, through an old friend of mine, a Pearson College student. Uh, is now deceased, uh, God rest his soul, um, Ken Hodges. Uh, years ago, he was, he was working in, in uh, the old Santa Fe Railroad Station in Gallup and wanted to, he wanted some mountain property and he looked for some mountain property, he talked to some ranchers. Long story short, he, we, we were able to buy uh, a fairly large piece of property, a number of Catholic families and, and set up uh, and that property we, we had we enjoyed through through many many years a, a lot of our children uh, you know grew up up there playing and, and having a wonderful time great memories camping out yeah and it, yeah just a, a, yeah a playground uh, a natural playground event. and and so in in recent years the last uh, two or three years with the monks coming out the young people decided well why don't we there was a, there was a, a a large piece of property that was adjacent to uh, to our property that that a developer had had for years and had not been able to to sell it mm-hmm. so uh, somebody had a, a good idea well, well let's sell this property and with g- donating 25 percent of it to the monks from clear creek and the idea if we, if we sell it we can draw other catholic families and by virtue of their purchases the monks will then obtain a large parcel of property and, mm-hmm. that, and that's exactly what's happened all right so how much property do they have well for they, this ha- they have originally have 60 acres and now it looks as if there was another piece or the last piece of property then this is it and now it will be surrounded entirely by national force there there's an opportunity for an additional 40 to add on to the 60 okay. so they'll have 100 acres and a few of those plots are still available okay you know <laughs> not, not a lot we're not buying know? but we have we do have <laughs> property at Clear Creek, which well, I know. That's is really you exciting were doing the, to me. The Someday, Benedict option, yeah, fifteen years yeah. before it was fashionable. Yeah, before it was cool. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so this, I mean, this sounds like a little better to me because it's the elevation, the ponderosa pine, and you're saying it's a forest. When I think oh, of New Mexico, I think of there are gravel, hun- there are, but it's a real forest. It's it's, it's there gorgeous. Are, there are hundred foot ponderosa pines okay. everywhere with oak and cedar trees, All right. and there are I it's, have to tell you there, there are elk and deer and bald eagles and. I shouldn't tell Priscilla. There might be a bear around, but they're they're pretty <laughs> harmless. The, okay. These bears, but okay. black bears. So and, there. So the, so are the are there monks are not living there now. They presently are not, but they are uh, building, and they have one building, and they're already starting on building number two. And the they plan, have a little chapel and a residence. Y- yes, a tiny there is. A, there's a chapel that our my friend Ken, who's deceased, and I and a couple other friends built. Oh, uh, so that and was they're using there. our little chapel That's and so cemetery. Beautiful. Yeah, no, it's, do, it's do great. Do you have some kind of memorial memorial thing for Ken you know his yeah his gravestone is there and it's yeah it's a, we do have a memorial so for he was him. buried there yeah he said there are we have a family or community cemetery right next to the chapel oh yeah okay. it's, 
It's real. I mean, it's 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 quite. It's it's very. You, you, it's a wonderful beautiful. place. Oh my be- gosh, Bill! So, so right, and if do, you and if you did have- if you did purchase property, let's say, I mean, you don't have to move there. Most of the families are doing it for two reasons: as maybe a family retreat, mm-hmm. and obviously to be and have their families close to the Benedictine mm-hmm. months because of the spiritual benefits involved. All right. So, a couple of priests. Are, they're priests. They're they're ordained monks, right? I mean, yeah, well, there are two different. There's a choir monk, and the choir monk is ordained mm-hmm. and, or in formation to be ordained. And then there's the brother monk, and he's the worker bee monk. Okay. So he's the, he's the cook or the tailor <laughs> or the shoemaker or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Step and fetch. Construction monk. And we've had a number of the brother monks coming out over the summer months because they're the carpenters and the plumbers and the engineers and those, those type Alrighty. of things. And they're, they're wonderful, wonderful men. But they always send a priest with the uh, worker bee monks, okay. the, the brother monks. So the, so there's someone there right now? No, there's no one there presently because okay. we're, in, we're into September. All right. Uh, so but there's there's plans afoot to uh, early next spring to start on construction on the second building. Okay. So they're, then, they went back to me, Clear Creek. All okay. right. So what is this entity called? Um, you want to tell me what that, how that works, uh, how they name these things? Uh, I, a foundation, it, daughter it house. Be, it would be called, it would be formally a, uh, by canonical law, uh, a foundation, uh, uh, a daughter uh, abbey or or priory associated, uh, affiliated with the uh, monks and the abbot at Clear Creek, Our Lady and MC. Okay. So it's a, it's a branch. And it would start out most likely, and I, you know, this is all, you know, subject to change, and I'm certainly not an authority, but they would most likely send out a small group, you know, 10, 12, like they sent from France to Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. It's time to branch out. Now they'll send uh, roughly glorious. the same, the same mm-hmm. group, and then, and they will start building and, and, and praying and working, and then, and hopefully those numbers will grow like they've grown at, at Clear Creek. Mm-hmm. And if Clear Creek's numbers continue to grow, then they might be looking for a third, uh, third site. Right. So, but this will take, you know, I mean, it, it took, well, you know, during the fifth century when the civil, uh, civilization was saved by the monastic communities, uh, we might be entering into kind of those uh, difficult times mm-hmm. in, with regard to our, our own country and our own, uh, our own yeah. children and grandchildren. And we thank God for these great foundations. It's a, it's a great we thank gift. God for it's, John Sr. It's a great gift. And um, I, you know, another time, Bill, I would love to ask you... Um, you know, how it is that we find good mentors for our sons, because you were so fortunate. Um, young men need great men. I think, I think you've kind of answered the question implicitly, Priscilla, by suggesting perhaps a, a, a visit to one of the monastic communities or one of these colleges that that you cited. I, you may not find your mentor there, but it's, it's not a bad place to to look. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Bill, thanks so much. That was great, Priscilla. Thank you.